a little bit behind. So uh, first thing we'll do is uh, city manager's briefing, Mr. Duhaney. Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time we'll start the briefing with a WebEx presentation from Deborah Bryan. She's in Richmond and she's gonna give us an update about what's going on in the General Assembly special session. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? That's what they all say. <laughs> Good afternoon. I guess they can. Sorry. Okay. Can you see me? I guess is the question. Well, good afternoon, because I can't hear you, so I'll assume that, that you can see me. Um, the reason I wanted to just touch base with you all today, good afternoon, Mayor and members of City Council, and City Manager Dehaney, the, uh, regarding the email that I sent you last night, I'm coming to you live from Richmond. Um, and regarding the budget bill, um, yesterday we convened, uh, or the, the special session to convene to allocate the $4.3 billion share of the federal pandemic relief fund from the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, procedurally today, the Senate has already met. Um, they passed this budget item by for the day and then they adjourned. The senators have uh, been given some additional amendments uh, for review and consideration, and they're going to reconvene tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, the House will reconvene right after this today at 3.30 to consider their budget bill. Um, and the main items in the budget bill were what I had said to you all last night as far as broadband access, small business tourism, um, boosting mental health and substance abuse and backfilling state unemployment trust fund, um, protections against eviction and utility uh, disconnects. Uh, I am coming to you today from a, a very special um, person to Virginia Beach, and that would be former city council member and now Senator, um, the Honorable Bill Bestef. Hey guys, just wanted to uh, say thank you for all you're doing uh, for the city for the state and for our citizens. Have a wonderful day. We're up here working hard for you. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Are there any questions, members of council? Okay, okay. Uh, Ms. Henley. Uh, <clears throat> and and I, I'm sure, I thank you all. If, we don't have to punch any buttons? No. <laughs> okay, good. That's when you vote. Uh, thanks. Uh, in all of these, plans, I always keep wondering if we have flexibility in flooding in, in these things that we've been talking about. I think y'all looked at the federal infrastructure, but I don't know if any of the state money, if we're able to use it for any of the um, flooding problems, mm -hmm. because it always seems to get left out. I know broadband and so forth are important, but. Mm -hmm. um, Deborah, I'm going to take a stab at this, but Council Member Henley, I do think the governor is putting a portion of um, the state's allocation for um, flooding and water, coastal flooding type projects. So I think that is something that they're considering right now up with the General Assembly. Is that correct, Deborah? But there, there, there's, mm -hmm. there's question whether they're allowed to use it for that or not. Right, as uh, Senator Steph was just mentioning, yes, there is some allocation, but it, there is still question as to whether or not there are allowable uses for that. And it's my understanding that most of the federal restrictions that have to do with that kind of, um, that segment of water is more about cleanliness of drinking water and, and that type of thing as opposed to storm water in the sense that Virginia Beach feels that storm water is, is important. Okay. Does that answer your question, Ms. Henley? Yeah. Any other questions? Answer, huh? <laughs> I don't have a question. I just point out that cleanliness of the water is part of the problem. It's, it's kind of very difficult to separate some of the projects that we're doing from the quality of the water is important as well. So what, what, we're, what kind of where we're putting it and what the quality is when we're putting it where, wherever we do is um, going to be a part so uh, just because it's quality and not doesn't directly say stormwater project I would 
wouldn't dismiss it out of hand. Well, I think the quality of water is directly targeted to drinking water because of what the issue in Michigan and other uh, parts of the country have uh, pipes that go back historically to a different composition. And uh, so I think this is more dealing with so quality of drinking discharge. water, not quality of effluent discharged into waterways. Thank you, Mr. Mar. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Deb. We appreciate it. Okay. Next item. Mr. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of council, at this time, Valerie Myers from the Communications Office will give an update on the Flood Protection Program Implementation Plan. Today, basically, we're going to brief Council on where we are with the Communication Plan and get some feedback and some guidance from Council as it relates to the next steps as we roll out the Communications Plan. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Members. Um, and just uh, to, before we get started, I want to let you all, you all should have copies of the full um, survey reports, uh, both the one we did with publicinput.com online and the one that was done through the third party firm, Issues and Answers. Um, Julie Hill, our communications director at the last meeting before your break, she provided a high level um, overview of the key findings from the surveys, um, but we just wanted to make sure that you all had the um, final reports from each of those. Um, before I get started about the communications plan. So. Um, the first thing we want to uh, do is show just a quick 30 second clip of a video. We're producing a video um, through our consultant to provide information about the flood protection program, the projects that are included in it, um, and information about the bond referendum. We just want to show a quick 30 second clip to give you an idea um, of what that entails. This bond referendum would pay for 21 major projects and other improvements in six major areas. They would be built over the next 10 years on a timeline far shorter than currently scheduled, all to provide Virginia Beach with fiscally sustainable long-term flood protection. Here are the projects as listed in the Flood Protection Program referendum. First, in the Lincorn Bay Drainage Basin. Clip and it'll go through each of the project groups and all the 21 projects that are included in phase one of the flood protection program. Um, and the video should probably be completed uh, within the next week or so. But that's just to give you an idea. Um, next, we'll just go through um, all the means uh, beginning actually this week, later this week, all the means that we are going to deploy in order to reach residents to provide as much information as possible on the flood protection program um, and the bond referendum that will be on the ballot in the upcoming election. Um, we'll start with online. We'll have um, all the resources through the city website, which would be the BBGov headlines on the home page of the website. We have a flood protection plan um, web page that has been um, up for the last couple of weeks. We'll start driving people to the web page where they can get the most up-to-date information. Um, on any activities we're doing surrounding the program um, and the events calendar as we work towards um, having community meetings. Uh, we'll utilize the events calendar for anyone who wants to attend. Uh, social media, we have huge followings on all our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor, uh, which we'd also use to reach um, constituents. Um, resident databases, we have several departments who have very robust um, resident databases that they regularly communicate. Um, with and we'll use those, we'll leverage those to get information out as well, uh, parks and rec libraries and also the school systems. Um, we have hard copy collateral. You all should also have a copy of the brochure that we've developed that um, has, it's the ripple effect brochure. It has the bond referendum question on it, um, all of the 21 projects and the price associated with each one of them. And um, on the back, there's a pro also a project timeline to give people an idea of um, the timeline for most of the projects. And we have some uh, FAQs on there as well. Is that this document? Yes. Okay. Yes, that brochure. And that'll be provided um, when we have in-person community meetings, um, uh, anyone who, so they can follow along with information or uh, take away with them. Or we'll also have them available um, here. Uh, we plan a postcard mailer to go out to um, all businesses and homes in Virginia Beach and 
uh, throughout the month of September, we'll have an insert in the um, city water bill um, that will hit homes throughout the month. Um, I believe it's around 85,000 people um, that still do receive hard copy water bills, and we'll have an insert um, with information about the uh, program in that. And um, as I mentioned before, in person, we'll have um, planning to have community meetings um, in person, and we'll have a virtual aspect as well. Um, including along with the stakeholders meeting. Uh, we want to engage civic leagues, um, other associations, condo and neighborhood associations, and also uh, have a presence at the pol pol police citizens advisory commissions that each of the districts have as well, monthly meetings. And this is just a snapshot overview of the plans for uh, what we uh, plan to do for this month in August. And as you can see, pretty much uh, every other day, if not every day, some weeks, we will be pushing out information to make sure as many people as possible are informed about the topic. Um, and I'll just go through the weeks um, of August just to give you an idea of what we'll be doing. Starting this week with the campaign launch, um, we'll have information um, on the homepage of the VBGov website, and we'll push out social posts across all the platforms that I mentioned earlier. Um, we'll have articles in our this week's uh, Friday City Manager's Update and the City Page e-newsletter that goes out every other Friday. Uh, next week, uh, we don't we're pushing to have a our first community meeting at least by the end of this month, sometime the last week of August, and we'll start promotion on that next week uh, along our social channels. Uh, we'll have a news release, information on the website. Uh, we'll create a Facebook event, which um, we leverage is because people can uh, RSVP through the Facebook event, and it gives us a good idea of attendance uh, beforehand. Uh, again, the city manager's update and social media posts. The following week of August, we'll continue to promote the community meeting through social media, uh, the city manager's update, and again, the city page e-newsletter. And the last week, which would be the week of the event, Again, uh, just hit social media, all our platforms with reminders um, to get as many people um, as who want to come out to the uh, community meeting. Then moving into September and October is when we will leverage some of the other um, platforms that I mentioned before. The water bill insert again, that will be hitting homes throughout the month of September. Uh, we'll utilize the resident databases. We have a, a ODU is developing a research report that I'll give you a little bit of detail on in the next slide about that. Um, our VB411, which is a online um, news segment that we do periodically for um, topics to get information out to residents, and we'll move forward with more community meetings and other public outreach. Just to give you a little information on the ODU research report, these are uh, some of the, the bulleted items or some of the things that will be included and in what they'll be giving us input on. They'll uh, provide information on recurrent flooding and sea level rise from both the sea level rise adaption strategy and the Norfolk Virginia Beach Joint Land Use <coughs> Study. Um, they'll provide an analysis, which is the pay now or pay later business case um, for in, anyone to know if we don't move forward with the projects, uh, what could result, the impact of the result of that. Um, a summary of public perceptions and preferences related to flood adaption options. Um, they'll provide a GIS overlay of all the protection projects, a case study of other locations uh, relevant to what Virginia Beach is doing that we can uh, glean information from, from other areas that have had a similar approach. And we'll get feedback, of course, on our approach, our messaging, storytelling, toolkit, all of these things that I've mentioned to you today, we'll get feedback in that research report from ODU on our approach. And these are just, uh, I have a few, three or four, social posts here are things that we want to do because we want to introduce people to the ripple effect um, and where they can get information on the website and we'll have the web address vbgov.com www.vbgov.com slash ripple effect on pretty much everything we do to that'll be the main area where anyone can get their information and we'll just drive that home this one um, just to pick someone uh, in a certain their ballot to let people know the flood protection program uh, bond referendum will be on the ballot this November and they can get information about it there. The next one, uh, learn about the plans to help protect your communities from recurrent flooding. Just a more general information one where people can go to, the, to Ripple Effect um, on the website and get that information. Um, and you, we'll use some statistics or, or some um, message, uh, metrics that we received from the 
surveys that we did uh, where we had 40 percent of uh, percentage of people polled who would be willing to pay a five cent or ten cent increase in their real estate tax rate um, to fund the flood protection program and we have 86 uh, percent of residents polled they want to see Virginia Beach take action to protect our communities from risk of flooding and these are just examples of some of the online and social media um, ways that we'll do use to reach people with some um, information and that's all I have for you today if anyone any questions mr. Questions? Moss just a few observations Ms. Henley. I would I would not just my personal view I don't know that giving polling information to public is they should vote for something because 40% of the people think it is or shouldn't do probably might not turn out like we think so maybe it's best to stick with the facts of why people should be voting for it rather than saying because people could look at that may not be as smart a move as we think certainly it it didn't convey me it made me think harder about why um, the other part we've often talked about and I know you were at the workshops it's these are the projects we can do in this 10-year program but there's a lot of projects that are to come in the next phase and we and we really haven't talked about you know our whole program is to make all of Virginia Beach high and dry right and this is our ability to do this in pieces and we pay off the first segment of debt depending on how fast we do that that's an important discussion for later but people are going to want to know that you know what are we, we might not have the price tag for them and all that people are going to still want to know <coughs> where's the whole thing and I know we've talked about that a lot I don't know how that fits in here but we really have a 20 program maybe by 2045 to deal with all our remediation somehow I think somehow we people are going to be asking that question I think because they're not going to see their neighborhood they're not going to see their project but you can only do so much at a time so I think ultimately we have to talk to that I I thought the presentation and the thought process was very good Valerie so I, I like that I was just referring to that I think we've got to talk to that and the other piece I think maybe it's not here but someplace is what this means in terms of people's future flood insurance costs we talk a lot about not flooding but we didn't get to the dollar and cents of what this means to Chubb Lake or what it means to Central District District when all of a sudden now they go from the current risk premium of FEMA which is only going up to the preferred insurance rate I don't know how to actually phrase that that definitely is a huge maybe OD will talk to that but we have because people in those areas know the insurance premiums they face many of them just don't pay it because they can't afford it but their house is still at risk so those would just be three thoughts one I don't know what the polling information you might want to just think about that two is how we talk about phase two so at least that they know those are projects that are in the next 10 years but we got to get these parts done phasing and then lastly is really communicating we're trying to get all of Virginia Beach if we can into the preferred risk category and that would be a huge achievement I don't know any community that has actually achieved that and I think we'll get there at the end of the 20-year period if we do all these investments all of Virginia Beach will be a preferred risk for and that means a lot for jobs that means a lot for our defense industry that means a lot for our businesses and homes so I would mention that but a great present I like that picture it reminds me of Asheville Park <laughs> I think that we don't want to always use Asheville Park please right. thank you thank, thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much well um, my first um, thought is forget the mailer the postcard mailer I think that was a big flop when we tried it before with the voting system uh, I think it was a waste of time and forget it I think putting it in the um, um, water bill is a good thing because we know then it's going to get there and to people who are going to read it but I think it's a waste of time and money to send that postcard um, I think it's very good to think we're going to have a website that's going to answer all the questions but I think we found out that that isn't exactly the way to get information out on the voting system either uh, it might be a lot of information there and for people who are techie and who like internet that might work but you got a whole lot of folks who never do that I think the in-person meetings are going to be the key to this whole thing 
and I, for one, am, and I've said it to a couple of groups that I have already spoken to, I'm available any time between now and November to go to any group and try to answer any questions because that's the problem when you have something just in writing, if it's on social media or wherever, is people are not being able to get questions answered or to discuss it with other folks. And I think that's going to be a key part of it. Uh, so I think we need to be uh, really stressing the opportunity to meet with anybody who will have us or any one of us or any staff people at all. And I think if we don't do that, we're missing the opportunity that, that we need to take. Um, in, in the groups that I have talked with, I know that we need to be able to answer questions much beyond these CIP projects, primarily the maintenance questions because that's what people are going to want to know. They want to make sure that we're going to be maintaining what we've already got. And I think we're supposed to be getting some kind of data on that within the next couple of weeks, because that's going to be key. Uh, people are going to want to know, well, I flood now, what are you going to do for that? And an awful lot of it comes down to maintenance. So I think it's important that we're able to, to address the entire uh, spectrum of what we do, not only these bond uh, referendum questions, but the maintenance is really big, and then other things that we're doing uh, to make sure we are uh, uh, going to address the, the problems. The questions that I have had uh, have been like, are, are these prioritized projects? Uh, are some more uh, higher priority than others, or uh, what I think the answer is that they're all important and we're going to be working on all of them, but I'm not sure if that's the right answer. The timeline, I think you all, you just said 10 years. Um, I think that's if we leave things in the CIP. I thought the bond referendum was going to allow these things to be addressed earlier. I, their people are going to really want to know the timeline um, and how we're going to be paying for it is going to be critical. Um, and I think that component about the fact that if we do the bond referendum and as what I think is in the thinking now, uh, we would not be increasing the stormwater fee any further. That's critical. And I think we've got to have all of this information on the tips of our tongues to be able to answer these questions because they are the things that people want to know, how we're going to be paying for it. and. Um, uh, other questions that, that I have had asked to me has to do with, well, how is this affecting our overall debt? I think we're going to have to be able to answer all of these questions. And I don't think you can do it uh, just by saying to people, um, uh, watch or go to Twitter or Facebook or, or go to our website. I think we're, we're going to have to be able to address the whole spectrum. And I think that a lot of it needs to be done in in-person meetings. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Mr. Yeah, thank, I just wanted to say to that, um, Mrs. Henley, thank you for your comments. And yeah, we have, uh, we're working very hard to pull together um, these community meetings. And we've already been contacted by a couple of groups that are interested in it. And thank you for um, offering up to um, help us with getting the word out on this. I'm ready. I'm thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. okay, Mr. Morse and Mr. Tower. And then Ms. Wilson. The, the point I wanted to make, and I know we've made it several times, the, the staff isn't going to be able to push us across the finish line on this referendum. It's the 11 people that sit at this table. They're going to want to be able to know that, and many of these questions, some of us can answer better than others, but at the end, we got to all be able to answer them with equal competency. People want to hear from the folks that sit here that they elect why they're asking them to vote for this. So I think we really are the people that have to use the supplemental information, but people are going to want to hear from us firsthand whether we do our, you know, you come out and film this when we go talk to the public when we're at these places, but I can't imagine any place where the city is speaking where there shouldn't be a council member or two present telling people directly because we're the people they elect, we're the ones telling them why this is, and if we can't answer all those questions, they're going to say, well, then why should they be voting for it? I think that's Mrs. Henley's point. And, and I, so the, we really do need, as we would call them, maybe those senior leadership talking points, 
because I think we have those answers. Uh, I've heard, I think we've heard them at different points in time, but never consolidated in a single spot. But we need to be as a team here unified in the message that we're telling that story. And we've heard the personal experiences of people whose homes have been flooded and all this. This is a community investment over a couple generations probably, but they need to hear that from us. And we're not gonna get across the finish line without us being on the front lines telling people why they, why we have to, I won't say pay up, but why the risk is not worth taking and the investment is worth making. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Right Tower, then Ms. <laughs> uh, Wilson. I just a question about the community meetings. I know it's a work in process, but do you have plans to for the without regard to being invited to attend civic leagues or whatever to to hold uh, community meetings in every district? Uh, in in how how many of these are you talking about, and how are you going to schedule them? Yeah. So currently, right now, what we showed is a draft implementation plan and. We met yesterday with um, Councilmember Bellucci, and we had a conversation mm -hmm. with him. And I, I, I'll extend this to all of council: is we have um, hesitancy on doing 11 different meetings in 11 different areas. But if that's what it takes, by all means, this is such a big or ask seven. of the community. Or seven, yeah, this is such a big ask of the community that we will hit the pavement with you. But we were definitely. We want to do is if you want to do a bunch of town halls, we'll definitely bring the staff support to kind of help you through the town halls and get you to do the information as well. But we are planning to do probably a series of about three or four regular community meetings as well. But that is just the baseline minimum, you know, to um, Council Member Moss's point, you know, to the extent that council wants to have different meetings with different groups or if they want to be in their districts with their civic leagues and they want staff support there to provide information to the public, we will be at your disposal, absolutely. Well, one of the main things we want to do is get it on the calendar so mm -hmm. that we know when they are, we can get them on our calendar because calendars fill up. And uh, I would want to give this priority to any anything else I'm doing to at least 10 the ones that I think uh, people in my neck of the woods would expect me to attend. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, Ms. Wilson and then Ms. Uh, Ms. Henley. This is all really good discussion, and, and I think uh, it's really important for us to all get in. I just wanted to talk about the water bill for a minute because not everybody gets the water bill. Like, I live in a condo, and so I don't get that. So I don't know if we want to reach out to, and there's people in apartments that, that vote as well. They probably don't get a water bill either. If there's some way that we can um, send something out yeah, we are including um, condo association and other homes associations in our outreach as well to uh, make sure that we can reach as many people as possible. And, and how about Definitely. apartments? I'm sorry? Apartments. Yes. Yes. Apartment community. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Henley. Uh, as far as, you know, community meetings, uh, thinking back to the uh, around the city kinds of meetings that we had during the time we were developing the sea level rise report the turnouts were disappointing uh, and some of them we had far more staff than we had people and, uh, and and they would tend to be the same people who would go to each one because they were the people who were interested in the issue I think we need to not ask people to come to our meeting but we need to ask to be invited to come to their meetings and say, can we come to your meeting and answer questions about the bond referendum? We, we need to go to where there are already people meeting for something else, because I think these community meetings tend to be a disappointment when we're thinking of 100,000 people and we maybe get a couple of hundred, that's not getting to the people that we need that are gonna be voting. I think we need to go to the people. We need to ask to be invited to their meetings. Okay, hey, anybody else at this point? Um, let me just say, I apologize for running behind, but I was at a meeting at the Brock Center at the request of the uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and they had uh, Gina McCarthy, who is a White House advisor on uh, you know, all the environmental and stormwater and things, and we met with a group of 
academics and uh, there were several Congress people there. So there was obviously an avid interest. And, uh, you know, we had some presentations by some folks about some very proactive things that are going on in Virginia Beach and Norfolk in terms of how we're, you know, starting to handle this. But obviously, uh, th things are more. And it's going to take an involvement of the federal, uh, uh, state, and local government to accomplish a lot of things. But um, one of the things that, you know, I guess, you know, we were always kind of cautioned about advocacy, but there are other organizations out there, like, the, you know, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and a few other interest groups that may have an interest in maybe doing PSAs for us. Uh, you know, they can go out and do it. So that might be a possibility or an a avenue that uh, we can look to get on Cox TV. And um, they've always been receptive to us. And, uh, you know, maybe even some news spots or radio spots that advocates could do that, that, you know, people could do that. So, but we appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. All right, so I guess we're on to pending planning items. All right, Mr. Mayor, at this time, Bobby Tahan and the planning staff will come and give council an update on the planning goals for the month of August. Hey, how are you? Good afternoon. So Bobby Tahan and I are here this afternoon to provide you with a quick overview of the planning items we have scheduled for this evening as well as for August 17th. So we have three for you this evening and item number one was actually deferred by the City Council back in February of this year as the applicant was not in attendance and they were not able to address your questions concerning the removal of trees, drainage, as well as how the homes might orient when the property is developed. Staff did request of the applicant um, to provide us with that information so then we could provide it to you in advance of your voting meeting. However, the applicant um, indicated to staff that it was their desire to speak directly to you. So I believe over the weekend you were provided with a correspondence from the applicant's representative and he will be here this evening to speak to you about this proposal. To refresh your memory, this is a request to reconfigure two lots. The smaller 10,000 square foot lot was improperly created by deed back in 1961. Despite that, it did formerly contain a single family dwelling. And that dwelling was removed in 2019 as it did fall into a state of disrepair. The existing two acre lot was appropriately and legally created by Platt. However, that site has never been developed. Neither lot currently has, nor will it have, direct access to a public street, so the subdivision variance is required. Both lots will meet the minimum lot area requirement of 40,000 square feet, and staff did receive five letters of opposition from surrounding property owners. They noted concerns related to the removal of trees and also concerns about flooding and drainage issues. The Planning Commission does recommend approval subject to an additional condition that would require a 20-foot wide treed buffer that's shown in green on the bottom right of the slide. And the applicant did provide some updated conditions that are recommended to you in that correspondence from this weekend. That would include an expansion of the private access way from 15 feet wide to 25 feet wide with a 20-foot pavement section. So this is one that you will likely discuss this evening. Item number two excuse me, is the same applicant and it is on properties along that same private access way and it is south of just that last application. In this instance, each existing parcel has been legally established, one in the 1940s and one in the 1950s. So today, the property owner could construct, as a matter of right, a single family dwelling on each site. However, as the reconfiguration of the parcels shown on the far right there would result in the lack of minimum lot frontage, a subdivision variance is requested. Each lot will meet the minimum lot area requirement of 40,000 square feet. 
and an increase in density is not contemplated as no new lots are proposed. Staff did receive one letter of opposition noting concerns related to impacts to the natural resources in the vicinity as well as the perception of an increase in density. The Planning Commission placed this on their consent agenda and recommended approval. I, yes, ma'am. Could I address yes, these? Ms. <clears throat> I, I think it's probably a good idea if I tell you some of my concerns here and we can save time later on. Um, I have a, a great deal of concern about these. I had asked a lot of questions back in February, and I thought we would have some kind of briefing uh, from staff before it appeared again, but that is not, didn't happen. Um, because the neighbors were asking a lot of questions about drainage, uh, this backs up to a lot of the, or some of the lots in West Knight Villages who have had a, a lot of drainage issues. Uh, I also, <clears throat> in just reading what's in our book, at our staff report, it just talks about a 15-foot private road. And we have had a similar experience just on the other side, just to the west of these lots uh, over the past few years with Riddick Lane. And that is a nightmare. And I want to make sure we don't create that again. And I think this proposal or this offer to make it a 25-foot instead of a 15-foot private road will uh, help with that situation. But I am asking that our staff give a good hard look at what happened with Riddick Lane and make sure we don't do anything to replicate that again because that isn't good. And um, a 15-foot access, which now serves quite a few houses, uh, is a, is is a nightmare waiting to happen. I can't imagine a a, a, a fire out there and multiple uh, fire engines trying to get back there. They can't maneuver. They can't get out. <laughs> uh, there was no fire hydrants, so that means you got to have a tanker. It's not going to work. And I don't know how we allowed that to happen, but we did it by doing these subdivisions of resubdivisions of old lots piecemeal over time and we lost track of what was happening I think. Uh, this particular section along Indian River Road is in the last six months has really shown a lot of activity. Uh, because of old lots, most of them I suppose are have frontage on Indian River Road and they're able to pick up these lots and and build them on Indian River. It's happening on both sides of Indian River Road. The area is poorly drained uh, and as single family lots they're not able to have a, a, a group resolution of the drainage uh, and uh, Indian River Road is not a good road to have all of these uh, driveways entrance. I mean you don't slow down on Indian River Road unless you want to take your life in your hands but um, We've got, to, we've got to really look at what's happening out there and make sure if there's anything we can do to help that situation, we do it. Um, in, in this particular situation, uh, the city attorney's office looked at it very closely. These are four okay. uh, lots that are legal. And, um, and I think with this, but we've got to make sure that it's what is here in this letter and not what is in our agenda that we adopt for the conditions, and we'll go over that. But I do just want to let you all know that I don't like doing this. I don't like these four lots where they are, but apparently we have no choice. But we're creating an, a, a nightmare out there, and you all need to know about it. Okay, thank you. I'm sure okay. we're going to have multiple speakers on that. Okay. Uh, I'll just save my discussion Moss. for there, then. I'll just wait till the open session for my concerns. Okay. Thank you. So item number three is an application for a modification of conditions for an existing borrow pit located along Princess Anne Road at the North Carolina border. Specifically, this is a request to expand the borrow pit by 17.32 acres, and the materials mined from the pit provide private commercial and government entities with fill sand, masonry sand, clay, and fill dirt. No detrimental impacts to drinking water wells or <coughs> impacts to the aquifer have been reported and the Commonwealth's Department of Mines, Minerals and Agency indicated to planning staff 
that they have been operating without incident and in compliance with state regulations. Recommended conditions do require that a quarterly report be submitted to the Department of Public Utilities to ensure that there are no impacts to the groundwater as a result of this expansion. There is no known opposition, and this was placed on the Planning Commission's consent agenda. Before you move on, yes, sir. I just want to mention, if you look on page three of the staff report, you will notice that in 2006, when the city approved whatever was taking place then, there was a requirement that the builder had to, the operator had to construct a left-hand turn lane. Now, clearly, somewhere along the way, that requirement went away. But my point is, obviously, we have a responsibility for oversight. So here we are 15 years later correcting something that wasn't needed. But it means we weren't watching to see if someone complied with the requirement so we could find out it wasn't needed. And when someone we make these conditions, what this points out once again, that no one is watching to see if the terms of the conditions are complied with. So we should have great concern. And I shared that with the city manager privately. This isn't the first incident. We are seeing a trend. And, and more importantly, I did point out to him as well is the fact that the staff and acknowledging that it never happened didn't even seem to care that it didn't happen and didn't offer any explanation as to why it wasn't caught earlier and why it wasn't brought to our attention before 15 years later that something that we put into a condition never happened. So I've asked him to take a look because if you find one example, there's probably more. And we just need to make sure that when we make conditions, this council approves that something happens or people come back and tell us something changed. But it shouldn't take an applicant asking for something more for us to discover something we already should have known. Okay. Anyone else? So moving on to August 17th, we have 18 planning items scheduled. I will note that none of those are short-term rentals, so you do get a break Yay. during the month of August. Item number one is an amendment to the zoning ordinance to remove the existing 600-foot distance requirement between businesses that offer tattoo and body piercing services. This amendment was requested by Council Member Jessica Abbott, and it was placed on the Planning Commission's consent agenda as there is no known opposition. Items two and three are applications to remove 1.22 acres from the corporate landing business park and incorporate it into the adjacent property, which consists of an existing appliance sales and service business along General Booth Boulevard known as Dr. Johnny's Appliances. These properties are located in the Special Economic Growth Area 3, which recommends in the comprehensive plan non-residential light industrial uses that are compatible with the ACUS regulations. The existing improvements, excuse me, whoops, the existing improvements will remain and a new 5,600 square foot warehouse that has a, a residential scale to it is proposed to provide storage for the appliance building, uh, business as well as indoor storage of several limousines. There was uh, no speakers at the Planning Commission public hearing, no known opposition, and this was on their consent agenda. Item four is a request, a request to close half of a 15-foot wide alley in the Croatan neighborhood at the oceanfront. The viewers met and determined that the closure would not have any adverse impacts on the public, and typical of street closures in Croatan, a public drainage easement is recommended to be retained over the area to be closed. Can we go back to that last slide? And my only point is, I don't know how much, and doesn't show on how much, did that mean that the balance of that's what's shown between those lines is still owned by the city and hasn't been deeded over to the property owners? Yes, sir. Because what, Mr. Mayor and uh, colleagues, what I'm wondering is a lot of people are paying a lot of money just to go through this process. And if really, if we're doing it for one, we really ought to be looking at, from a city point of view, do we really want to have this incremental approach or we really want to go out and you know, I would yield to Mr. Tower and approach these property owners and just collectively see if that's the case and with one swoop just kind of do it versus this piecemeal approach. I'm just looking for a way that if we're not holding on to it 
and w that would be our choice every case it doesn't make sense just incrementally go down this line maybe we could do this as a more consolidated view and just move on with it just a thought mr mayor and colleagues so my suggestion i would offer to the city manager thank you Item number five is an application for a conditional use permit in order to operate an eating and drinking establishment, specifically a smoothie bar within a proposed wellness center along Princess Anne Road in the Princess Anne District. The zoning ordinance does require a conditional use permit for a restaurant that's located on property zoned O2 office district. The footprint of the restaurant can be no more than 10% of the floor area of the principal use. No neg negative impacts are proposed, and staff as well as the Planning Commission recommend approval. Item number six is a conditional rezoning request from conditional B1 Neighborhood Business District to conditional B2 Community Business District in order to allow a retail use on this property, specifically a Dollar Tree. The current proffers associated with this site limit the uses to simply a pharmacy. A Rite Aid was within that building for numerous years. However, the property has sat vacant for quite some time. The proposal includes the reuse of that existing building and also a new vehicular ingress egress along Round Hill Drive to reduce the commercial traffic that was um, before the modification using uh, Charlotte Way, which was used primarily for the northern, um, res the residents to the north. Any potential objectionable uses that would normally be, be permitted within the B2 district are proffered out, which means they would be prohibited. And while there once was quite a bit of opposition, Council Member Wooten, the neighborhood, the applicant, as well as staff, met several times to address the neighborhood's initial concern regarding vehicular ingress egress and so there were no speakers at the planning commission public hearing there's no known opposition and this was on their consent agenda and now i will hand it over to the planning director to finish you off thank you oh thank you hey bobby how you doing good sir how are you mayor members of council next item is items number seven eight and nine by winners properties llc it's for conditional rezoning from A12 to B2, as well as conditional use permits for automobile storage, as well as a car wash facility to support an existing automobile sales establishment that is at the corner of Nelms and Virginia Beach Boulevard. The applicant is proposing to do a two-phased approach to this proposal, uh, to this proposed development uh, for the automobile storage. Uh, they are proposing to uh, first build the proposed parking lot, and then as phase two comes around, they will plan on building the car wash facility uh, at this time it, there is no time frame specifically called out for that Nelms Lane is a single vehicular access ingress egress access point for the eight residential communities that surround the property and I'm sorry I'll go back to here you can see there's a, a few townhome communities as well as other uh, residential communities that are uh, behind this proposed rezoning The applicant is proposing to provide additional plant material above the minimum as shown on this proposal uh, that around the perimeter of the uh, parking area. Staff uh, rec did recommend denial on this request due to the potential impacts to the existing residential units. The Planning Commission uh, recommended on a six to one vote with one abstention to, to approve the request. There were two speakers in opposition at the Planning Commission public hearing and there was one letter of support of a developer of the townhomes that were located across the street and one letter of opposition. Mr. Mayor, if I could. Yes. Just looking at this picture, I know we just got our forestry management plan update. And remember when we went back and talked about how we wanted parking <laughs> lots to look versus how they've looked? Mm -hmm. I've made a comment several times. We have a policy, which is guidelines. I've yet to see a parking lot that looks like the policy we said we wanted. We continue to see this. This isn't what we saw in the policy. So either one, we need to get rid of the policy that we have, we never follow it, or we need to see some evidence that the policy that we say we want to achieve is actually seen coming into fruition. I don't know which is right, but all I know is I never see one that looks like that policy brief we got. So maybe you can come back and tell us 
what we're not doing or need to do incentivize or whatever to get what we want but so far I've yet to see anything that looks like what we say we want thank you item number 10 is a conditional rezoning from a 12 apartment district to 01 office district this property is developed with an existing office building uh, that was long constructed in the 1970s this rezoning is a uh, more to clean up that issue uh, of when the office use was permitted in this zoning district uh, it is zoning it to uh, to correct the non-conforming status that of course now in, uh, in an apartment district that office use is not permitted when it was constructed there was a six-foot privacy fence that was constructed adjacent to the residential units uh, to the south uh, the applicant is requesting to rather than remove the fence and, in, and install a 10 foot wide evergreen landscape buffer for them to continue to maintain the existing fence that is along the property uh, Planning Commission placed this item on their consent agenda and there is no known opposition to this request Item number 11 is designed by Eleni from in the Bayside district at 2416 Seaview Avenue uh, this is a request for a change in nonconformity to demolish an existing legally nonconforming duplex to construct another duplex in its place. The 1950s duplex is slated to be replaced with a three story duplex. Uh, the property is zoned R10, so the use is considered nonconforming. Uh, the applicant is proposing to meet all the required setbacks for the R10 zoning district. Uh, however, they would like to uh, continue to keep the uh, two unit use that is on the property the applicant met both with staff and the Bayfront Advisory Committee and the Bayfront Advisory Committee is supportive of the application after the applicant has made adjustments to their design uh, as shown here in this elevation uh, Planning Commission did recommend approval and get places on their consent agenda with no known opposition Item number 12 is Atlantic Park Incorporated in the City of Virginia Beach Development Authority. Uh, this is in tandem with item number 13 as well. This is for a street closure of a portion of 18th Street uh, adjacent to 1880 and 1811 Pacific Avenue and uh, 319 18th Street. 18th Street is currently an 80 foot right of way, which is, norm is larger than uh, the right of way that is necessary for similar streets at the ocean front. Uh, the request is a closure of both uh, above ground closure as well as an underground closure to allow for the foundations and uh, other utilities or other things that are developed with the proposal to be underground uh, the remain the proposed closure above and underground is 27 feet and the remaining 58 feet of the right-of-way is sufficient to accommodate the full street skate improvements uh, as a typical right-of-way is is usually 50 to 60 feet in width uh, the viewers staff and Planning Commission all recommend approval of the request item number 13 is the alternative compliance for Atlantic Park Inc it's a proposal for two mixed-use buildings with residential commercial structured parking indoor outdoor entertainment venue and an outdoor surf park as the Commission is well aware of the alternative compliance is for related building heights, setbacks, uh, building types, and the conditional uses that are contemplated with the proposed use. Uh, propose the proposal or the, the form of the proposal right now um, meets what was the general concept that was uh, referenced in the RACEAP 2030 plan. Uh, the project doesn't meet the review standards of the alternative compliance uh, requirements of the oceanfront form based code as alternative compliance is typically used for uses and developments that aren't contemplated by the existing form based code uh, this is definitely a unique proposal the proposed building uh, does need a uh, the alternative compliance for proposed height which includes portions of the existing of the proposed parking garage which does house a, a number of parking spaces. Uh, the first phase would be 1,052 uh, parking spaces that would be provided in an eight level parking structure. Uh, the proposed residential units that are located interior on 19th Street uh, of that parking garage meet the height criteria for the, uh, for the alternative, uh, for the existing form based code. staff does recommend approval as well as the Planning Commission recommending approval with this going on their consent agenda as well 
Item number 14 is at 172 South Plaza Trail, and that is not in the Beach District. Um, the proposal is a modification of conditions for an existing tattoo parlor. Uh, staff does recommend a approval, and the Planning Commission recommended approval as well. Bobby, that is the Beach District. It is in the it Beach is. District. Yeah. yeah, it's part of that weird section. Oh, that's right. It is the, that juts in. I apologize. Yes. Um, I remember now looking at it multiple times thinking I was wrong. <laughs> Um, there is an existing tattoo parlor at the at this establishment. Uh, they are proposing to expand into the adjacent space. Uh, there has been no known incident at the existing tattoo parlor, which has been operating since 2019. Items 15 and 16 uh, are on West Lane Road. It's a subdivision variance uh, and a floodplain variance. To, to construct, I'm sorry, to construct in a single family home. Uh, staff does recommend approval and the Planning Commission on 8 to 0 vote also recommends approval. I only ask that you identify specifically what hardship they meet. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the, the property was created by deed in 1972 and met all the requirements at the time for the creation of a lot that was zoned agricultural, that would have been a, a, agricultural limited at the time. And for some unknown reason, the, they never legally established a lot by recording a plat. So it was previously deeded in this fashion. <clears throat> the property has been assigned to deepen and has been taxed uh, by the city for over 50 years as a buildable site. Uh, the proposal is in the best location possible as far as to avoid the floodplain, as well as to minimize impacts into the Southern Rivers buffer watershed uh, for the Southern Rivers watershed. As you can see here, one of the conditions also is noted to build uh, in order to be sensitive to the flood requirements that it will be built on piles. Um, there is no known opposition to this application. Item number 17 is by Jeff Heitkamp at 1140 Cordova Court. This is for a home occupation for retail sales uh, for firearms. Staff recommends approval and the Planning Commission on an 8 0 vote also recommends approval. Again, the applicant is requesting a, a conditional use permit uh, for these sales. The hours of operation are by appointment only during normal business hours. As is typical, conditions recommended require a security assessment of the home by the Virginia Beach Police Department within one month of, a, of obtaining the conditional use permit, as well as another condition that limits the number of hand-to-hand -hand transactions per month to four. Uh, there was opposition at the Planning Commission public hearing who noted concerns related to traffic safety and increase in potential burglary. Uh, Planning Commission did unanimously recommend approval. I do have a question. Yes. Um, in looking at the way this is styled, it says it's a permit for a home occupation, retail sales, parentheses, firearms. Would any retail sales require a conditional use permit? As it being considered a home occupation, yes, ma'am, they would. All right, so any it's not, not just firearms, it's any home occupation. I mean, if somebody's selling cookies or has a bakery in their home and to sell from their home, they would have to get a conditional use permit. To sell from the home, that is correct. So it's not just firearms. So we're looking really whether there should be retail sales from a house, yes, period. That is correct. Yes, ma'am. And the last item is item 18, Cosmos Corner, Inc., uh, in the Beach District at 503, 505, 507, and 511 Central Drive. Uh, this item is a request to expand an existing commercial kennel along Central Drive, uh, which is west of uh, NAS Oceana. The applicant's dog training and daycare business has been uh, successfully operating, and they would like to in increase their uh, footprint by incorporating additional buildings at the site. The use meets the requirements uh, in the ACUS uh, for the greater than 75 noise zone and is permitted is a permitted use per the Navy restrictive easement. Staff did re did receive seven letters of support, and there is no known opposition to the request. Mr. Bolucci, Mr. Tahan, please um, forgive me if I could have missed something, which is certainly possible. But if you turn to page 11, um, you'll see that in Rose Hall there's a, a red dot indicating an application from Linda Cortez. And I did not see that in the package we received today. So I just want to make sure that um, that I'm not possibly missing. Yeah. 
and I could not find that application in the presentation materials you shared today. That is correct. I believe, I'm sorry, Mr. Bellucci, that was, was, I believe that was an item that was withdrawn, and it may have been a holdover. From yeah, no, no problem. I mean, it's definitely mistakes happen. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing something, and certainly that we're not missing something as a body. That's right. Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Bellucci. That was a holdover map from the Planning Commission. So that item was withdrawn because the use was not permitted. So that was a residential kennel in an apartment district. So okay. It is not supposed to be on that map. Thank you very much. Yes, Appreciate sir. it. <laughs> Can we go back to the previous one that Ms. Hanley asked about? And that is the one, <coughs> the firearm sale. Thing. Yes, sir. Uh, do I understand correctly that? with that retail in there that they could retail anything in there the request is specifically for the retail of firearms what he does is they he engraves firearms and because it's considered a transaction he has to get a conditional use permit for for that as well as get approval from the ATF so it's limited to firearms that is correct that is what he is proposing that is this particular application is limited to firearms correct but if it was somebody who wanted to have retail sales of anything, they would still have to come in and get a conditional use permit. So I'm kind of, <coughs> we almost ought to just have it say retail sales, period. Understand. Yes, ma'am. We, we do that to inform the public and, and maybe unnecessarily to separate it out. So, but you're correct. We can only view this as retail sales, not, not based on what they're selling. Yeah, the, the fortunate thing is, you know, with the firearms issue, then it sort of becomes a, a Second Amendment issue. And it's not that at all. Right. Yes, ma'am. You're correct. It's retail sales. That's correct. And so what we're supposed to be looking at are the planning issues related to having retail sales in this neighborhood. That is correct. No matter what. Yes, ma'am. We are not, although we subset it out in order to inform the public, the art, the standard for reviewing it is to see whether the land use impacts related to sales not not the firearms portion but sales is, is appropriate in this location okay mr moss no okay just move my hand mr tower mr mayor uh, 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 if i may so that i while i've got bobby here can i just ask him a question it's not related to this but is related to his zoning could you tell me the status of the uh, 24th Street lay down area that uh, several people in that neighborhood have complained about. I will. I believe I was told they were given a time, uh, two weeks to move from a, about a week ago. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Inspector Hirschberger went out to the site. I do remember this conversation now. He okay. talked to last week about it. I'm just it, very, I'm just very. Uh, concerned that we make sure that happens in a timely way. Yes, sir. I will follow up uh, Thank with you. Kevin. <coughs> I have okay. another plan. Uh, Mrs. Henley. Uh, since you're here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if I may. Uh, before the pandemic, we had started the review of the comprehensive plan. And we kind of said, well, we can't do this because we can't go into neighborhood. We can't have the meetings. But now that we're back, we seem to have delayed the comprehensive plan review substantially. The last report I had was that it wouldn't be updated until another year or so. Why? Well, we need to restart our public outreach. So what we've done is, as the governor relieved his restrictions at the end of July, end of June, July? For the moment. Yeah, for a moment, yes, sir. Uh, we then we have been trying to make sure that we gear up to meet with the public as well. And so we have been working on that behind the scenes. We are essentially going to kick off our public input again, uh, open as it was before. Uh, hopefully we won't get limited with anything going on moving forward, but we are we are working on that schedule now. Um, but it does because we are 
trying to obtain as much public input as possible, it does push the writing of the document uh, f uh, forward because we are trying to reflect that. Maybe I saw something and looked at a year and it just seemed to be delayed a couple of years and I didn't know why it would have been delayed so much because don't we have a requirement that we review it every five years or some such? It is required to be reviewed but not necessarily wholesale changed. So uh, what we're trying to do is, is, move, is try to be as uh, deliberate as possible in order to reflect council's desire for us to get the public input. So uh, we have made amendments and reviews to the current comprehensive plan re relatively recently within the last five years, which I believe meet the state criteria. However, I would say that we are continuing to move forward. As we know, there are some policies that need to be updated to reflect council's desires. So thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor, yes, if, I, if I may provide a quick update as well. Uh, there has been some questions and concerns about the enforcement for short-term rentals. I did want to provide council with an update prior to us going into the further discussions uh, as we go into September. Uh, we are working through enforcement. We have unfortunately ran into a few hiccups through the enforcement process. Uh, because of that, we have not sent out our mass mailing yet because we were not, mm -hmm. we did not want to be ill-prepared to not be able to, for those that we do put on notice, uh, to take them to uh, to issue them a civil summons without having the correct path laid out. Uh, what has unfortunately happened with uh, this process, as it's new for everybody, it's also new for those in the court as well, uh, the clerk as well as the judges. So what we are working together to try to make sure we get it, we get the information to them the way that they want it so that we can prosecute them appropriately. Unfortunately, a couple of them have gone a little sideways uh, as far as the documentation that is being requested of our staff, which was different than what we thought we had to provide, as well as which court and what date that we need to be in there and further conversations are being held with, with the court in order for us to do that properly. Because of that issue that we've been dealing with, and it seems to have compounded over the last four, four to five weeks as we've been doing enforcement, I have directed staff to hold off because we don't want to give the false, false sense that we're able to continue to move forward if we can't do it. And so we want to make sure we're as efficient as possible uh, as we do this so it doesn't go, get to the back of someone's mind. Once we send a mass mailing letter, we will then go out uh, with no need to wait the 10-day waiting period as we've discussed with the uh, city attorney due to the recurring nature of the short-term rental violations, and we'll issue civil penalties uh, as necessary. But unfortunately, we're trying to get the, uh, the clerk of circuit court as well as um, uh, the others that are involved in the enforcement process on the same page as us as well. Okay, any questions on that, Mr. Moss? Do we have an estimated point at which we think when well, we come back after Labor Day, we expect to have that resolved? I'm just trying to find what, what date in the future should we, if we don't hear anything we should ask. We, we believe so. Uh, Mr. Stiles and his office has been in contact uh, to try to get some of these issues resolved. So we believe we should have it by the end of August, September uh, resolved. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, okay, anyone else? Okay, Bobby, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, city Council discussions or initiatives, anybody? This is concerns or just initiatives? Oh, well, we got count comments right. and things, but you, you can bring up concerns to, if, now if you want, John. Well, you know, I earlier mentioned about, and I just want to bring it back so that we don't lose focus on it, is uh, as we look towards the October, early November five-year report, that we have seen nationwide, the average single price home of a home nationwide is up 23% year over year versus May of getting to be 363,000 and used cars are up 32% year over year over May. So when we get our five-year report in October while looking forward, I think we need to have a meaningful discussion, maybe even at a retreat before. I don't think any of us here are looking at harvesting a 32% increase in real estate prices on people from income taxes when incomes haven't gone up 23%, nor have people's income gone up 32% on their cars. So I have asked the manager to work with the Commissioner of Revenue and Real Estate Assessor so we can get a look at that, so we can see what the really what policy we want to adopt so that we're ahead of the curve versus just letting the process play itself out and people get this 32% increase in their used car over last year. And you know what kind of feedback we get from that. So it's, I think it's best to get smart ahead of time and, and be ahead of the, lead the duck, so to speak, and then adopt a policy that we can communicate, takes the pressure off the staff, makes the, the, the residents more comfortable that we're looking ahead and that we're not, and um, people don't think in school systems, however, that there's this big thing of revenue coming when reality we need to 
mitigate that, offset that to some extent. So I just want to let you know, remind you that that's a issue I think we, we need to talk about. Yeah, I think that's a very important thing. And John, thanks for bringing that into the consideration. And I think you do it preemptively, Ms. Communicator Wilson and then Mr. Bellucci. Well, I think we all know that today is National Night Out. And this comes up every year. And so often we can't be in all these different communities and, and to help recognize um, our men and women in blue with, with, with the neighborhoods. So I'd like for our uh, maybe our clerk to work with the city attorney and see if we can make a change so that we're not missing this night, which I think it's really important for us to be out there in the community. Um, and I know we have the two weeks in July, but maybe there's a way we can sort of rearrange things so that we can be available to, to be out there on National Night Out. So I always feel so bad when you know, people say, are you coming? And they say, well, no, I have to be at council tonight, which is our important job. But if there's some way we can do something so that we are available for National Night Out. Yeah, that's, it. that's something that I think we can brainstorm and come up with something. You know, maybe, I don't know if we can slide a week, uh, last week, June uh, or July, first week, August. But, you know, I think that's something we can do. Or maybe even just make it, uh, if we can uh, mark, would it be feasible just to flip it from a, a, a formal meeting and do a workshop and just switch the dates? Is that a possibility? The council can do whatever the council desires to do. Okay. It just needs to do it by either it needs to be codified ordinance that's permanent or it needs to be uh, an ordinance that's then posted in advance as required by the state code. But is that once, a possible? Once solution? we understand when the council, you know, what the council wants to occur during that meeting, we can certainly draft an ordinance that accomplishes that for the council. Okay. So can we do it so that? Or is that a one-time thing, or it has to be done every year? You can. Well, right now, you're right now. The the city code says that your meeting schedule is the first and third Tuesdays of every month, except July and December. In which case, uh, you meet the first two meetings in July, and the first two meetings in December. You can go into that code section, and you can change that, and it becomes a permanent change. Uh, you just need to let us know what, you know, if you want us to say, you know, all of that plus the first meeting in August will be a workshop and the second meeting in August will be the first regular meeting of that month, we can make that a permanent change if that is the will of the council. Is that a good way to go, I think Council? That's an excellent way. Does anybody object to at least moving forward with that? Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah, very good recommendation. Can I one more thing? Yeah. If I may, we, we absolutely can do that. And if we're going to do that, you may want to um, address Election Day. As when the, the council moved to first and third, we've had, I guess, year over year uh, sort of conflicts with the Election Day. So clean up all at once. Yeah. I was going to say, would you like us to do both? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Would, would that be OK, too? Yeah. I would assume to have, if the Election Day, I wouldn't want to have a workshop or an election. I'd assume we not meet. Not meet. Correct. Yeah, okay. Not meet. OK. And then I just want to bring up one more thing. Yes, that, please. Um, <laughs> 9-11 is going to be the 20th anniversary this year. And do we want to do something to recognize that? Yeah, I, I, you know, a number of folks have kind of approached. And what, um, what about a, uh, at least a potential of a um, council uh, proclamation or something along that? And maybe some type of, uh, you know, presenting it to um, all the branches of our law, law enforcement. Yeah, and maybe, and maybe Julie, because she's, she's so clever, can come up with some, some ideas of what we could do to recognize. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. But, you know, definitely something along the line of the, you know, comprehensive uh, city council proclamation and, uh, you know, maybe some type of ceremony that really <laughs> honors. You know, I think that would be tremendous. It's a, it was a terrible day. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, anyone else? Mr. Bellucci. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to bring something up as a follow-up for this body and, and I think most importantly for the um, members of our community um, to the, it's been about two months, approximately two months since this council approved an um, Urban Agricultural Advisory um, Commission. And one of the conditions that we um, 
discussed in holding off making appointments to that was that uh, we needed to provide an update to the Agricultural, Agricultural Advisory Commission um, out of respect and deference to their work. And I uh, would like to report that I did do that um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, I think that really cleared the way for this council to begin making appointments to that, to that body. Um, as a matter of um, uh, courtesy, certainly, it's the least we can do um, to honor the spirit of the work that was advanced by our former colleague, Ms. Abbott. But I think most importantly, um, for those people who are interested in this issue, both for and against, um, to have their, their voices heard. So um, we do need to make appointments to that commission, and, and I would encourage um, each member of this body to consider who they would, who they would like to begin considering who they would like um, to represent their district um, on, on that 11-member on that committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, Ms. Wooten. I just wanted to mention really briefly, Friday I attended a um, policing engagement retreat meeting, and by no means can I uh, tell you everything that went on, but I think it's important to note, and some of you may know about it, but it's important to note, it was started by um, Pastor Jason Knight. He's working with Chief Newdigate, um, but he also worked with one of the precinct captains, and forgive me, the, his name escapes me right now, but they got together, started with the initial meeting right after everything that happened down at the oceanfront in March uh, with the shooting, and they, they really wanted to make sure that they were working with residents, faith-based community, the police, elected officials, everyone, to really, really effectively address the issue with gun violence, uh, working with our youth, and so many other areas that, that's encapsulated in that issue. Um, but it's just very promising. This is probably my second meeting. Um, they have, um, or they are working with a, a group, uh, I believe they're called CRS, and they're with the Department of Justice. And they're going to be, in upcoming um, dates, they're gonna be working to do sort of a, um, it's gonna be a program that invites the community to come out, youth, residents, elected officials, everyone across the board to really have some dialogue, some serious dialogue about what's going on in the community. And um, they did express, because um, we also had members from the business community from the oceanfront down there as well, and their concern was, and they requested that city council be a part of the events and going forward be involved in, um, you know, what's occurring, what's uh, transpiring with this really incredible initiative. And so I just wanted to kind of give you just a summary of it. I uh, certainly will send you more information um, as it becomes available to me regarding invitations uh, and, and so forth. But I think it's really important to see what the community is uh, actually getting together and doing on its own and working with the police and our faith-based community to really address some of these really um, difficult um, systemic issues that we've had in our community. And I think it's important that my colleagues are aware of that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Anyone else? And if I could say over our little uh, respite, there were quite a few community engagements that went on. Uh, East Coast Surfing at Pembroke um, had an honor day for all of our first responders. A number of folks came. And I'll tell you what, it was pretty, they had a police dog demonstration and they actually had a police officer that was an expert in skateboarding who is working with the skateboarding community, but that was very well attended. And once again, it was our public uh, safety folks were there for demonstrations. And last week, uh, Council Lady uh, Wooten and I attended uh, a thing at Chimney Hill where uh, Reverend Williams ran. Uh, and I'll tell you what, it was amazing. They had COVID shots set up. They had a drive-by where food uh, you know, could be picked up. And once again, there was a strong engagement 
from our public mm -hmm. safety community. Santero was there with doctors and uh, physicians to help, and it was well attended by the community. <coughs> you know, um, Sabrina, would you like to mention anything else about that particular thing? No, I'm, I'm glad you did mention that because that, that was a very, um, very important uh, community event because as we address COVID-19 and, you know, the variants that are uh, still really uh, prevalent in the community, just having Sentara there, um, focusing on testing that we still have to do, focusing on um, the vaccination clinics. Those are vitally important still throughout this process. And just to have Sentara there, you know, Dr. Uh, Theron Williams, who, you know, put this together with a lot of the community um, individuals, as well as our police um, fire department was there and um, so many other different community leaders in our residents. It was a really important event to have. Um, and the band was good as well. Oh, they were phenomenal. <laughs> And if I could just uh, finish up, John. Um, and then one more event we had, and I got to give compliments to our colleague, Mr. Bellucci. Green Run had their 50th anniversary celebration at Green Run High School. And my goodness, what a you know, fantastic turnout that was. Uh, a, a truly good community event. And when you think about um, you know, the magnitude of Green Run. It was the first PUD in, you know, in the city. And got, my God, you know, Michael, how many thousands of homes there? Was it 30? It was more than 5,000 households in the Green Run community. It's the largest homes association in Virginia Beach and I think safe to say the largest neighborhood in Virginia Beach and one of the most diverse as well. And so it was um, a great tribute to the strength of the community um, the event that they put on produced and it was so well supported by the city got to see our city manager police chief sheriff mayor uh, members of the general assembly and and so many members of the community who were all there to come together to strengthen their connections and celebrate everything that is wonderful about the green run community which we know is such a strong and wonderful community and i really want to take this opportunity um, to thank the mayor for his support for the Green Run community and as well the city manager and an entire city workforce who were there from, um, I think from public works and public safety and code enforcement. I saw a code enforcement official there. I mean, the city was really, really um, it opened its arms to embrace the Green Run community and it did not go unnoticed and is very well appreciated by, um, by certainly by me, but I think more importantly by the members of the Green Run community. So thank you very much, Mr. Duhaney. And when you think about, you know, the communities, you know, uh, Virginia Beach is comprised of 453,000 people made up of many communities all over. And, you know, uh, Green, uh, Green Run is kind of like the epicenter on the map of uh, just an engaged community where they got together and they do, they're concerned about public safety and taking care of each other, and they really exemplify what community means. But uh, thank you, Mr. Bellucci, because I know you work with Heidi and uh, the other members there. And you know, but once again, uh, you know, Mr. Dehaney, I tell you what, the way the city represented a number of these events out there, they're, they're tr you know truly initiatives to build community. Thank you. Mr. Moss, did you have something? Yeah, I just want to mention we had our 70th graduation of our police academy during the break. You know, the mayor spoke and the chief also spoke, but it was a pretty impressive uh, group of 26 candidates who became police officers that day. It was a very diverse group. It was nice to hear the number of people from New York that were uh, joining our police force, some of them for the first time. But if you get a chance to watch the uh, video of that event, it was a stellar event and uh, some, some natives as well, but it was diverse in every aspect you could think about. Matter of fact, I mentioned to the chief, he should get that young lad from uh, New York, like we do in the Navy, to go back to New York and find other folks who are looking at law enforcement and find we have a much more community supportive group of our police department than you find in other parts of the country. But the, the mayor's remarks and the chief's remarks were just stellar as were the remarks of the president of the class. But it's a, it was a great day, and it was a great video of all their training. So uh, 
<laughs> hats off to them. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, there were, I think, some Jersey people sprinkled in there, too. But there were. <laughs> yeah, they can say coffee and get away with it. All right, good stuff. Thank you all. Any other uh, council comments or liaison reports? I, I have one short comment. Uh, at the last meeting, the council had asked Mr. Moss and I to meet with the uh, builders group, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, uh, I was able to be there at the first meeting, and Mr. Dehaney was there. I think Mr. Moss had something else to do that day, I but uh, uh, I thought it went well. We we had uh, I think we broke some ice as to what some of the differences of opinion were, and I think uh, probably cleared the air on some uh, uh, lack of understanding, I guess, as to what the real issues were and how they could be resolved. And uh, so I just wanted to report to you that that uh, that effort is has begun, and I want to thank the staff for the way that they handled it. and. Uh, and uh, responded. So I just want to let you know that we are working on the issues, and I think with the positive attitude of the staff and so forth, I think it's going to go well. Oh, thank you. Tell you what, yeah, that was good. A lot of was accomplished on the break by so many people, you know, at this dais. Thank you all very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wood, we're ready for the uh, agenda. Yes, yeah, so that's a fairly short agenda. Um, ordinances and resolutions, anybody wish to pull or vote no on items one, two, or three? I, I, I'm probably going to vote no on one and two. But they're speakers, so I think they're being pulled because I thought we had speakers on those two issues. We have planning these. items? No, not, not oh, planning. Sorry. Oh, no, ordinance sorry. Resolution. I, I'm ahead of myself. Thank you. Are you okay with ordinance yes. resolutions? Okay. That's fine. Every planning item is pulled, so okay, that's it. Okay, moving right along expeditiously and you know, almost exactly on time. Way to go. Uh, the chair will entertain a, a, a chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from the open meeting allowed by section 2.23711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Publicly held property. Discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or of the disposition of publicly held property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiation strategy of the public body pursuant to okay. section 2.23711A3, Beach District and Bayside District. Legal matters. Consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation or litigating posture of the public body pursuant to Section 2.23711A7. And there are three items. Estate of Tyree versus Colas and Tufts Williams. Uh, Stephen Booth versus City of Virginia Beach and opioid legislation. Personnel matters. Discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body pursuant to Section 2.237A1, and that's uh, appointments, council, boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees, and also the City Council Kempsville seat. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. Okay, motion by Mr. Moss, second by Mr. Wood. Vote is open. Ten to zero. Okay, we are recessed into executive. <laughs>